them saying area of something like uh, the rectangle there, I can, I can do this. I can get some type of measuring tool out, measure the base, and I can measure the height, and then I can figure out how much you know, floor covering I need for that guy right there. If you look in the Bible, it's, it's very descriptive of measurements and what they used. You'll see measurements of a circle. You'll see an a approximation of pi in the Bible, right? So we have the world around us that kind of fits into our geometric shapes, right? But then all of a sudden you start having life not stick to the geometry, right? And so you ha start having a ball thrown in the air and then you have someone sitting there going, well, this is not going to be falling into just a, a pattern of what I can predict with what I have right now. So surely there has to be a way to predict this. Surely there has to be a way for me to predict when that ball is going to hit the ground, right? And so all of a sudden they started seeing things that did not fit into what they already knew. So as most things, God is a God of order, they fit into a pattern. And so they found the pattern and backed into the formula, which is what they did with something like pi. They were like, huh, did anybody else notice the diameter and the circumference Van Horn. keep coming to the same exact number? That's and here we longer. have pi, right? We have something that's related. Um, and so this is what you'll see in calculus. We have a problem. It doesn't fit into the mold that we know. Does it fit into something we just don't know yet? And so people who were way smarter than me with way more time on their hands than I have sat down and said, let's figure out what the pattern is. All right. Make sense. So that's where we come up with the tangent line problem. So let's look at page 45. It says this notion is fundamental to the study of calculus. It has two problems. Um, and the first problem that they come up to is called the tangent line problem. And the second one they came up to is the area problem. So we're going to talk about the tangent line problem first. All right. Except for cases involving a vertical tangent line, the problem is finding a tangent line at a specific point, And they want to find the equivalent slope of that tangent line. All right. And so they said, well, Mm, we have a little bit of an issue. What if we draw it wrong? What if we do, you know what I mean? There's like so many errors that can be made. And so you'll see they start out with this secant line. A secant line cuts it in half. A tangent line touches it at one specific point. All right, so we have this secant line. And anybody who's done any math for any length of time can find the, the slope of this line. I, I'm just gonna say rise over run. How far up did I go over how, over, um, how far over to the right or left I went, right? Rise over run. Very simple. And so um, I have, oh, is this? No, no. All right, so if you look at the top, we have, and we did this a little bit last year, we have f of c plus delta x minus f of c over this c plus delta x minus c. We have all these, these symbols, right? By the way, when you see calculus, delta is triangle, it means change, all right? So delta means change, all right? Change in whatever. Whatever it's in front of, it means change, okay? Um, so if I were to break this down for you, it's going to look way more familiar. If I look at the top, f of a number, f of 2. Well, f of 2 is going to be the y value that happens when I plug in 2. That's how it is in any equation. So if I were to do something like this, f of x equals x plus 3, right? f of 2. 2 is my x value. That is 5. You just told me that my x was 2 and my y was 5, right? So f of something is just saying what is the y value when I plug in the x value, right? And so this f of c plus delta x is saying what is my y value after my c has moved, right? c plus how far x changed. So this we could call y2. What's my second y value? And then we subtract it from my original y value, f of c. Now, if this is my second y value, this is my second x value. And if this is my first y value, this is my first x value. This should look very, very familiar. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. What does that sound like? It sounds like slope. 
all right? And so you'll see that they're using what they know to figure out what they don't know, all right? The difference between y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 and this crazy guy is that x is changing. Whereas when I would give that to you in Algebra 1 or Geometry, you had this line and you literally had to find your second y value, which was not changing, and your first y value, which was not changing, and put it over your x value, which was not changing, minus x value, which was not changing, okay? So then they said, okay, so we understand it's changing, but what if we could get it to approach, and this is where they come up with limit theory. So they started out with this secant line here, and then they said, well, let's slope it a little different, a little different, a little different, until we get it just as a tangent line, and it's only touching it once. So what they're actually saying is, let's make the change in x nothing, all right? So we went from the change in x being this till we sloped it down, which means that my change in x is actually moving towards zero, where I actually don't have a difference in the x's, all right? And this is how they moved to what we're going to do as limit theory. The first part's what we're going to do as limit theory. So this is the problem that occurred. And they said, let's use what we know. Let's move it towards what we don't know. All right, but let's use a formula that we're very familiar with. But let's consider the fact that x is changing. All right? So flip to page 46. This is the second major problem in calculus. Moving on to area problem. This is the other area problem we had. All right, I can look at a rectangle and I can tell you the area, right? No, I might not be eyeball it, but I can measure it and I can tell you the area of it. Um, and then all of a sudden they said, that's tremendous, but let's say I throw that baseball again and I wanna know how much airspace underneath it. Um, you're gonna find this in my aeronautical guys that have gone on and gone on to something like aeronautics. They, they need to know arcs and they need to know curves and all of a sudden it's not fitting into the box of pre-calculus, right? Um, and so they said, well, what do I know how to do? Well, I don't know how to calculate the area under a curve but I do know how to calculate a rectangle. So what if I draw rectangles under a curve, right? And so you'll see that's where they started. We're starting with rectangles under a curve. Well, that's all fine and dandy. This is an estimate, however. Why would this be an estimate? Because it's not, it's not curved, so it's not right, I have some problems here. This little guy causes a little problem for me. This little thing sticking out here, he's not supposed to be there, right? So we have some issues with a rectangle. Well, this is four rectangles. So they said, well, hmm, let's make more rectangles, right? And so we now have eight rectangles. You can see that my problems are fewer, right? We do have this little, these little pieces, but we don't have these big chunks. So then what if I did 20? Well, if I did 20, I'm gonna get even closer. And so we're talking about the number of rectangles here. All right, and just like the change in X was moving to, to nothing, the number of rectangles is actually increasing. So then they said, what if we had an infinite number of rectangles? Now conceptually, that's hard to, to imagine. I can't draw it because that's impossible, right? <laughs> But if it was moving towards infinity, I would have the actual area under this curve, right? And so they're going to take the idea of area, but they're going to say, hey, this number that I need is actually going to move towards infinity. And we're going to use limit theory. We've talked about limit theory. We're going to talk about it more. But they're going to use that theory of as it approaches, even though I can't tangibly touch it, I can see the pattern of what's happening as it approaches, and then I'm gonna be able to figure out what the area is. Make sense? And so these are the two major problems that happen that cause them to start pushing towards away from like Euclidean, um, Euclidean geometry, right? Euclid was way back when, away from your Euclidean and Platonic stuff, Platonic solids, to um, something's changing and now we need to move away and take that information from Euclid, Euclid and from Plato and then we're going to move it into to how we can apply it to something that doesn't fit that mold. 
All right, I have 11 up here because I don't want you to sit there and calculate it out, but I want you to see we're using conceptually the same two things we talked about on the examples that we looked at. So let's approximate the length of the curve by finding the distance between the two endpoints. So think of it as a piece of string, all right? And they have this piece of string draped from 1.5 down to 5.1, okay? And they want to know the distance, and they want you to estimate it by just measuring straight across from here to here. That is an estimation, right? It's a valid estimation. It, it will not cover the same distance as that string, but it is a valid rest, uh, estimation, okay? And then they said, well, let's estimate doing this. Let's do different markers on it. So from this point to this point, however long that is, here to here, here to here, and here to here. Which of these two estimations do you think is closer to the actual length of the string? This guy right here, very obviously, right? And so they did just one segment, and here they did four segments. What would I do to get even closer? Nine segments, or 20 segments, or in calculus, an infinite number of segments, all right? And so this is what all of calculus is going to be doing. They are going to be saying, take what I know, use it to figure out what I don't know. And we may have to apply limit theory to get there, but we're going to take what we know, limit theory to get to what we don't know. And we are going to come up with a formula based on limit theory that will help us actually calculate slopes of tangent lines, areas under a curve, length of a curve, right? And we're going to use what we know and combine it with to get to what we don't know, all right? Oh. Finding limits graphically and numerically, all right? This is the introduction to limits. You'll see it has a chart here. The first concept of limits, <clears throat> excuse me, is to say, what am I moving towards first? I am moving towards the number one. When I say, what am I moving towards? You are talking about where is my X value going? So your limits are always gonna be in terms of X value <clears throat> as far as what you're looking for how it's moving. And then the actual limit itself is going to be the Y value. So in this particular case, the one that they're doing here, the X value is moving towards one, all right? So we're moving towards one. You'll notice that with limits, when they say close, they mean really close, right? So they don't mean close to one like three. They mean close to one like 0. 0.999 or 0. 0. 1.001, all right? Because the, the term close is relative, which is what you're going to find was part of the problem with the definition of limit, um, is that if you don't define how close, then your idea of close and my idea of close are two different things. But you'll see that what they actually are wanting is, is very, very close. They start out at most over here. We're 0.25 away on either side. And then we're here, 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 here. And so... They actually give you the function that this came from. If you look above this in your books, they have this function. It is f of x equals x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1, where x cannot equal 1, obviously. And so what they've done is they have taken these values, they've taken the 0.75, and they've plugged it into this guy. <clears throat> and we're not going to do that because I don't feel like it, but, you know, we can take their word for it that this is what you get when you plug it in. All right? Then they've taken 0.9 and plugged it in, 0.99 and plugged it in, 0.999 and plugged it in. Okay? And so we know by what we have chosen for x that x is moving towards 1. And then we see what is y doing, Right? And so we do that on the left side of the number. And then on the right side of the number, we do the same thing. They were 0.25 away. Then they were 0.1 away. Then they were 0.01 away. Then they were 0.001 away, right? Moving from the right in, okay? They plugged these numbers into this function and they got these answers. And if it has an overall limit, these answers from the right and from the left should be moving towards the same number. And the more the closer you get, the more obvious the number becomes. What number is it moving towards? Three, Three right? So the limit as x approaches one for this function will be three. Now, is it three when we plug it in? Well, we can't plug in a one. That's actually specifically excluded from this particular function because a one causes a problem. But we know that if we were to graph this thing, it would likely have some type of hole at one, right? All right? And so we could see that it would be going towards one on the X side and it would be going towards three on the Y side. 
And that's what limit is. Limit says, listen, I don't really care what happens at the point. What I do care about is what happens as I'm approaching that X value from the left and the right. What's happening to Y as I approach, all right? As I approach. And so you can estimate these numerically. We're just gonna zip through these because I do not make you estimate numerically because it's just a lot of number crunching. Um, and I know you know how to plug in a number into a calculator. Like, you know what I mean? Um, what I do want you to be able to do is to look at a chart and say, can I assume what the limit would be based on the chart? And so they've given me another function, x over the square root of x plus one minus one. What is the limit? So let's look at this guy right here. I wanna just pop this piece of it out. And I want to talk about him specifically for just a second. All right. We did this last year a little bit, but we want to go over some of this. This is saying, what is the limit as X approaches zero of this function? Okay. And so when you answer the question, you are telling me the limit. They are telling you what's happening to X. You are telling me what's happening to Y. Okay. And so that's what this right here means. What is the limit as X approaches zero of this function? All right, and so if we scoot him out the way and look back at this chart, looking at the chart first, you can see, well, from the left-hand side, if I were looking at a pattern here, I would say it's approaching two. I'm gonna look from the right-hand side. When I look at this pattern, it's approaching two. So I would say the limit of this as X approaches zero is two. So I can do that with a chart. Let's look at the graph, all right? Let's say I'm just given a graph, not a chart. This is the graph of this function from the left-hand side. So from the left-hand side, think about it this way. My X is going to zero from the left. My X is going to zero from the right, okay? So we know what X is doing. Now we're gonna look at what Y is doing. Well, Y starts out right here from the left and it starts moving up, tracking up to here, okay? From the right-hand side, it starts out here and it's tracking down. What is it approaching graphically? Two right? My Y value is approaching two graphically. And so those should all mesh, right? If you were to make a chart or if you were to graph it, they should all show you the same picture, that the limit is this X is approaching zero, the limit is, is two. That's what Y is doing, all right? And so that's what we're trying to get a feel for in this section is what does limit mean? What does limit mean? And it really means, what is my Y approaching as my X is approaching something that has been given to me? They will tell you what they want X to do, then you will figure out what Y is doing. All right, finding limit. So let's look at this guy. This is a specific type of function called a piecewise function. All right, a piecewise function. Now with something like a piecewise function, it, it is intuitive to its name. It looks like it's in pieces, okay? So they've given us two specific, and they're usually very explicitly defined. Explicit meaning they will give you a domain for each piece of it, okay? So they're telling you Y is always one when X does not equal two, and Y is always zero when X does equal two, all right? So what this looks like is this little guy right here, it's always two for every single number. That is a horizontal line, except one time. When X is actually two, it's zero. And so you get this linear type function that has a hole in it, and at the hole, it bounces somewhere else, okay? You will really only see that happen with a piecewise function, okay? Where it just jumps out of the graph and goes somewhere else. It's usually defined with a piecewise function. It'll say it's a parabola, except for this one time, then it's just defined by this point, okay? Those piecewise functions will sometimes look like this, and sometimes they'll look like a parabola and turn into a line or something, okay? So then the question is, well, what happens with limit here? So they want us to tell them specifically, and they have now written this out in words versus what we saw above. So up above, we saw the, the notation limit as X approaches whatever. Here they've actually told us in words. Find the limit of F of X as X approaches two where F is defined as this. Okay, that's a lot of words. They could have written it in notation form. They could have said the limit as X approaches to of, and they could have done this little guy here. Right? So these are the same thing. They can write it out or they can do it 
in notation form. Now here's the problem with this guy. I'm actually defined at two. So if I were to ask what does f actually equal it to, I would say zero, right? That's what it actually equals if I plug in a two. When it is two, y is zero. However, the limit is not zero. The limit as x approaches two is something else. What is it? Mm, that's not even approaching zero. So if I were to plug in, let's do, let's do my chart first, all right? Let's do my chart, and I'm going to do that guy here, right? So if we do a chart, and we say, what is it approaching, okay? And we do these little guys, and we say, okay, I want, oops, you can tell I'm no longer using my line. Okay, so we say, we're just going to do the chart, do several lines here, all right? What am I moving towards? What's my limit? Two. So this is what I want my x to be. So if I were to plug in 1.999, 1.99, and if I were to plug in 2.001, 2.01, and 2.1, right? And now we're to look at this chart. Well, for every number not two, my answer is what? One. One. All right, so... Is 1.92? No, so what should that answer be? What about this guy? What about this guy? What about this guy way over here? What am I approaching? I'm approaching one, right? Right? As I move towards this, if I were just using, you know, um, repeated patterns here, which is what you're using with charts, my repeated pattern tells me I'm going towards one, right? Yes, let's look at the graph. All right, so if I were to look at this guy right here and I were to travel along the line, I'm starting right here and I'm traveling along the line from the left and I start over here and I'm traveling along the line from the right. Where does logic tell me I'm moving towards? One, right? I'm traveling along moving to two, traveling along, but my Y value is moving what well, looks like it's going to stay right there on one. Nothing indicates that I'm going to jump off this line, does it? Whether graphically or in chart form. So what is my limit then? My limit is what it is approaching, not what it actually is. What am I approaching, both graphically and chart-wise? I'm, I'm approaching one, and that's what my limit is. My limit is one, even though when I actually get there, my Y value is zero. Nothing's telling me it's approaching zero. Everything is telling me it's approaching one. Limits and what it's actually defined at at that point do not always equal each other. They don't always equal each other. So when you have something like this, like a piecewise function, you have to say what is it approaching, not what is it equal. All right? If, it were so, if the graph were doing this, right, and it got to zero, then yeah, you're approaching zero. That's not what it does. The graph is steady. Steady at one, steady at one. It just happens to pop off of that when you actually get there, right? So chart-wise and graphically, your limit is going to be one. And that's what your limit actually is here. And that's the difference between what is the function equal and what is the limit of the function. Those are two different questions, right? All right, so limits that fail to exist. And this is on page 50. A couple reasons overall limits fail to exist. All right, first of all, we will get into left and right limits, but we are talking about an overall limit. In order for an overall limit to exist, you have to be approaching the same number from left to right. All right? So the example before, we had a horizontal line that just had a hole in it. All right? This guy's different. This is an absolute value that causes this issue, not a piecewise function. From the left-hand side, as I move towards zero, all right, I am approaching what looks like negative one, right? Does that make sense? It's on the track to stay at negative one the whole time, right? But if I'm on the right-hand side, the positive side of this guy, I look like I'm staying at positive one, right? 
The problem here is for an overall limit to exist, those two guys have to be heading towards the same thing, and they're not. If I'm on the negative side of this graph, I think I'm just going to stay at negative one for the rest of my life here, right? And if I'm on the positive side of this zero, I think I'm just going to stay at positive one for the remainder of this ride. Those are two different things. An overall limit does not exist. Now we'll get into right and left-hand limits. So I can say, oh, the left-hand limit is this, or the right-hand limit is that. But when I'm talking about overall limits existing, they have to be going to the same thing. Because what's your overall limit? Well, it depends on which train you're on, right? So if I put Michael on the left train and I put Connor on the right train, they're going to give me two answers because their point of view is telling me something different. Then overall limit does not exist, right? They have to be heading towards the same point for an overall limit to exist. That's your first thing. Your first thing is... Um, you're coming from two different directions and you're heading towards two different numbers, all right? The second problem that we want run into is what's called unbounded behavior. Now, once again, we will get into when you have infinity as a technical limit, but we are talking about real number limits when we say overall limit, not infinite limits. So it will express to you, hey, what's the infinite limit here, Okay. But when you're talking about in the real number world, infinity is not a technically a real number. It's a con number concept, right? So unbounded, meaning you shoot off towards an asymptote, all right? Even though they're both positive infinity, and if I were to say what's the infinite limit, you would say positive infinity, the real number limit doesn't exist here because you're shooting off to infinity, all right? And while from the two points of view, you're heading to the same number, you're actually heading to a number concept, you could not give me an actual number as a limit. If I said, what's the number, you wouldn't be able to give me one. You would say, well, I can tell you the concept. The concept is infinity, positive infinity. All right? And the last one is oscillating behavior. What does oscillating mean? So oscillating is back and forth. Now, this does not mean this gradual, like a sine wave back and forth, okay? So if you were to think about the sine graph, right? It's this beautiful little... We're talking about roller coasters, right? That's what it looks like, okay? You can have a limit for that because you're, you're gonna have something approaching. I'm talking about something that pings, right? Think about um, if you did, where would you have done it? Maybe in physics, if sound waves ping, right? And if you get too much of a ping, it's gonna do this back and forth really fast. That's what we're talking about for oscillating. At any given moment, you're gonna ping back and forth and you're not really just gradually sloping. We're talking about a pinging sensation. And they give you this example here. If you look at the example that they've given us, <clears throat> they have sine of 1 over x. 2, two over pi is positive 1. 2 over 3 pi is negative 1. 2 over 5 pi is positive 1. 2 over 7 pi is negative 1. We are pinging back and forth between these numbers, right? And so when this happens, you cannot have an overall limit. It's an oscillating behavior. And so that's another way we do not have one. All right? And then they give you this, this little common types. Those are the three types right there in the middle of page 51. Common types of behavior. In the middle of page 51, they list three. Different numbers from the right and left. Increases or decreases without bound, or it oscillates between two fixed values. Three times that you do not have an overall limit. All right, questions on those. So I would like you to find these limits. Find these limits. What are we approaching first? One, all right? This one jumps off the graph, it's a piecewise, but what is your Y approaching? What's your Y approaching? Three. Three, right? So my limit there is three. What about 14? As X approaches three, what's my limit? It doesn't exist. I do not have an overall limit. Does not exist. All right. And then what about 18? X is approaching what? One. What is Y approaching? Zero. Zero. Remember Y value, horizontal value, right? Or vertical value, which is horizontal, yeah. So horizontal is how you're, it's telling you to move. Vertical is what you're answering with, right? Very often people give me the Y value. Yeah, so this one is what I meant. This is not oscillating. We are, we are actually riding on this little roller coaster here. We're not pinging between two numbers, okay? So this is, it goes up, but remember when we talk about approaching, 
you're not going to start way back here. All right, so when we start here, you're approaching at zero here, you're approaching zero here.